Mitt namn är Lisa Pelling, jag är utredningschef på tankesmedjan Arena Idé som ordnar den här föreläsningen tillsammans med nätverket Gemensam Välfärd. Det är fantastiskt att se att det är ett sånt stort intresse och vi förväntar oss att det kommer ytterligare personer in här så ni får ha lite tålamod med personer som kommer att trängas in i bänkraderna här efterhand. Vi har flyttat den här föreläsningen två gånger. Vi trodde först att vi skulle ha en intern workshop på vår tankesmedja på Barnhusgatan 4. Och sen insåg vi att de här frågorna är så enormt stora i debatten att till och med en akademiker som föreläser på engelska kommer att dra ett stort intresse och då bokade vi sal på ABF och sen var ni så många som anmälde er att vi var tvungna att flytta den hit. Men det innebär också att det kan vara så att det kommer några eftersläntare som ändå har gått till ABF-huset som kommer att komma in i salen här efteråt. Jag ska också passa på att berätta att vi på Arena Idé tillsammans med Gemensam Välfärd försöker lägga ett förstärkt fokus på just sjukvårdsfrågorna nu under våren. Vi smygstartade i höstas med att ge ut Mats Wingborgs rapport Marknadiseringen av den svenska sjukvården, så gick det till. Den finns att ladda ner på vår hemsida. Ungefär samtidigt så gav Socialdemokraterna i Stockholms läns landsting ut antologin det moderata skyltfönstret om 12 år med moderat lätt styre i Stockholms läns landsting. Den finns, ges ut på vårt förlag Premiss, också väldigt läsvärd. En mängd olika bidrag, Susanna Lakoski, Nisha Beshara, Mats Wingborg, Jesper Bengtsson, Linnea Svedenmark, Daniel Matisen har skrivit ett varsitt kapitel i den här boken som beskriver de olika facetterna av det som skulle bli det moderata skyltfönstret i landstinget. Men som ni vet, i det skyltfönstret så står haveriet, eh, Nya Karolinska kanske på den mest framträdande platsen men det är inte allt som har gått fel i Stockholms läns landsting utan boken går också igenom problemen som har funnits med, med vårdval och de ökade kostnaderna och den ökade segregation som har kommit i, i vårdvalets eh, spår. Så det är också en, en studie tror vi kanske tyvärr i hur eh, moderat och landstingsstyrd sjukvårdspolitik kan komma att se ut i, i framtiden. Så det är ett, ett lästips. Vi fortsätter den här satsningen, den här fokus på sjukvårdsfrågor genom den här föreläsningen och den 27 mars, alltså här om knappt två veckor den 27 mars så kommer vi ha en utfrågning av landstingspolitikerna. Och då kommer Erika Ullberg som är oppositionslandstingsråd för Socialdemokraterna och Katarina Wahlgren som är ledamot i landstingsförmäktige för Vänsterpartiet. Men då kommer även Marie Ljungberg Skött som är sjukvårdslandstingsråd för Moderaterna och Margareta Åkerberg som är ledamot i landstingsförmäktige för Kristdemokraterna. Så de kommer att kunna ställas till svars. Det blir en utfrågning av dem och vi hoppas att ni har möjlighet att komma dit med era skarpa och vassa eh, frågor, undringar, funderingar, kommentarer så att vi kan få en riktigt bra debatt kring sjukvårdsfrågorna. För är det någonting som vi eh, ser från tankesmedjan och som jag tror att ni alla håller med oss om det har varit alldeles för lite uppmärksamhet kring de stora sjukvårdsfrågorna. De är så avgörande, de är en så stor del av våra gemensamma resurser. Det är så viktigt att de här frågorna får uppmärksamhet nu inför valet. Att, att varje tillfälle är viktigt. Sen kommer vi att fortsätta under våren med ett antal andra frågor. Vi skulle vilja uppmärksamma, ta gärna emot förslag från er, den stora tandvårdsreformen. Vad innebär det att man nu försöker ta ett steg till och se tänderna också som en del av kroppen, som en del av hälsan, som en del av folkhälsan? Vad innebär konceptet vård för alla i hela landet? Vi tenderar att vara som tankesmedia också lite stockholmcentrerade. Men vad innebär det för en sjukvårdsorganisation i hela landet om alla ska kunna ha tillgång till BB till exempel överallt. Och sen i maj kommer vi att ge ut Göran Dahlgrens bok om marknadiseringen av den svenska sjukvården och dess konsekvenser men också kommer han att skriva om möjliga lösningar. Hur ska vi trockla oss ur den här situationen? Hur ska vi kunna komma vidare? Jag ska inte ta upp mer tid här men jag vill uppmana er alla att följa oss och följa Gemensam Välfärd som också kommer att fortsätta att arbeta med de här frågorna.
och hålla kontakten med oss och inte tveka att ta kontakt om det är så att ni har inspel, idéer till hur vi skulle kunna uppmärksamma sjukvårdsfrågorna eh, nu. With this, I end my speech in, in Swedish and I switch to English. We are so delighted that you've taken your time to come here, Professor Alison uh, Pollock. Uh, Alison is one of the leading experts on issues that are very much topical in the Swedish uh, debate right now. You are the director of the Institute of Health and Society at Newcastle University. You've been uh, based at a number of other universities during your career at Queen Mary University of London. The Univers University of Edinburgh, but you also have trained in medicine and public health, and you've worked on the ground in the 1990s, thinking about how healthcare could be best organized, be best provided uh, in, in uh, working with district health authorities. And for eight years, you worked on planning and needs assessment and community care. So you are based in, uh, in, in these uh, kinds of uh, uh, experiences, but you have uh, a long academic career uh, as one of the leading leading experts, not only in the UK, but, but in Europe, uh, on uh, issues such as uh, the privatization of the healthcare systems and of uh, private finance initiatives and private public partnerships as they're used particularly in, in healthcare. I think you will all want to read more uh, uh, of what Professor Pollock has, has written and, and, and the debates that she's been involved in. I can recommend you a number of books, but I also want to tell you that she is published a new book. Uh, it's coming up now and we've, we are discussing to see if we can maybe try publish it in, in, in Swedish. She's written about um, the NHS, the privatization of our health care now. Ten years ago I think it was published a little bit more. Um, You've written the NHS, the new NHS guide, also uh, around uh, 10 years ago. But there's also on her website a number of articles in the New Statement, the Independent, and the Guardian. Uh, so there's lots of material there for, for you to uh, uh, to uh, to read and to uh, uh, share as well, because there are many important struggles in the UK that are extremely relevant for the struggles that we have in front of us uh, here in Sweden. I think when I get the opportunity to ask questions to Professor Pollock after her lecture, one of my first questions will be, what are your lessons for us in terms of struggle? How can we organize? What are the actors that need to be engaged? Are there the professions, the unions, us as great grassroots activists? What are the roles of, trade, of, of think tanks in this, in this area? But it comes afterwards. We have given uh, Professor Pollock ample of time to make a presentation, but we also want you to know that you have time afterwards to ask your questions. There will be lots of time for that. If you do not feel comfortable to ask your question in English, please don't hesitate to ask the question in Swedish, and I will try to translate and you'll answer in English. Also, if there is any um, concepts, words that uh, Professor Pollock is using, she's very comfortable of you just raising your hand and asking her to explain, and she'd be more than happy to, to explain. As you know, this area is also full of uh, abbreviations and, and concepts that may be a bit internal to the debate. Don't hesitate. You have made your way here. It's very cold today. So you have a privilege of actually stopping the speaker and, and making sure that you get uh, as mo much as possible out of this lecture. Taking too much time already. Professor Pollock, you are welcome. Give her a warm hand, please. Good morning, um, and thank you for the warm welcome and for coming today. Um, if I speak too fast, slow me down. And if you don't understand anything, please do um, you know, re interrupt. I'm sorry I don't speak any Swedish at all, um, and uh, I feel very bad about this, but uh, you'll have to tolerate me. <clears throat> so, <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit today about what's happening in England, uh, and to remind you that we no longer have a British National Health Service. We have four health services, one in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. However, only Scotland and Wales still have a national health service. England, which serves a population of 60 million people, is busy dismantling and privatizing it. 
and it's a very long story, but where we are at now is that the government is now moving very fast to Americanize our NHS. It's passed an Act of Parliament five, six years ago, in 2012, which really um, removes the duty on the Minister of Health, the Secretary of State, to provide the duty to provide universal health care, and now is moving very fast towards um, American systems. So I will try and explain, and I have far too many slides, what's happening to our NHS. <clears throat> how it's been dismantled and Americanized. <coughs> but in doing so, I'm going to show the high cost and unfairness of American health care. It's a warning. I'm going to show you how the NHS was founded on the principles of social solidarity and risk pooling and equity, and how the new bureaucracy that has been put in place moves away from the risk pooling and risk sharing to individualizing risk and risk shifting. And I'll also end a little bit to tell you about legislation that my colleagues and I have worked on and that has been in Parliament. Um, it's a new bill and that's part of the campaign strategy because what Parliament has taken away, our NHS, only Parliament can put in back in place. And that's why we've been working on an NHS bill. <coughs> now, yesterday was quite a sad day for many of us in the UK because the nearest thing we had to a secular saint um, was Stephen Hawking, who died. And he is not just special in being uh, one of the world's greatest cosmologists, but also his passion and understanding for people and public services. And last December, he joined me and three other people in a court action against the government. So we, the five of us, were taking the go are taking the government to court in May, May the 23rd and 24th, over their plans to Americanize the NHS. So we're saying they have no power legally to do this, even though they've created this Act of Parliament. The Act does not give them the power to establish American-style organizations called uh, ACOs. Very sadly, uh, Stephen Hawking died, but he was a great proponent and defender of the NHS, and he has made a marvelous YouTube video so if anybody's in doubt of why a universal health service is important. And of course, he relied very heavily on universal health care. And he also traveled widely. So he understood very readily that American health care could never give him what he enjoyed uh, for many years, for 40, 50 years and more. So his long life was due to having a universal health care, to never having to worry about health care bills. So he had his own fears with his illness, but he never had this fear. So yesterday was a very, you can read the Guardian and Independent reports because they also cover some of this. And this link here, Crowd Justice, was about um, our fundraising because access to justice in our country is only for the rich, and we have to go out and we have to raise funds from everybody to take the government to court. So I'll come back to this because it's part of the resistance that's very important. But I'll also remind you from the beginning, and of course Swedish people understand this very well, that the welfare state was really an inspiration that came out of two world wars and a very long struggle and it was about abolishing poverty and Beveridge, who was a liberal, he was not a socialist, he was a liberal and economist, he designed, of course, the plan for slaying the five giants of want, ignorance, disease, squalor and idleness. And so the National Health Service was only one of the five pillars of the welfare state. And what's happening to our NHS has happened to education, 
It's been privatized and marketized to poverty, welfare, also privatized, reduced and marketized. Housing has disappeared. We have almost no social housing in the UK. Homelessness numbers are rising. And of course, unemployment is high um, as well. And of course, in Sweden, you've had full a policy of full employment for many years, but that's disappeared. So you have, in many ways, modelled yourselves on us. So that's a reminder that what's happening to our NHS is happening to all of our services, and the same will be happening, I have no doubt, in Sweden. But the four pillars of the NHS, and this is Nye Bevan's creation, were that it should be publicly funded through central taxation as being the fairest way, in public ownership, so all the buildings and land were owned by us. Publicly accountable, direct accountable to the people, not just in Parliament, but also at local level. Public provision of services and equal access for equal need. And free at the point of delivery. Very important. And so for many years, decades, it became the model maker for the rest of the world, aspiring to universal healthcare systems. So most European countries followed suit with either Bismarckian or beverage type systems. Um, and some, like Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, wasn't until the 70s and 80s that they brought in their universal health systems. But it became the model maker. Am I going too fast, too slow? It's okay. Now, public funding and public ownership were necessary for risk pooling and social solidarity. The risks are shared with the healthy and well, with the poor and the sick, and that was very important. And that's in complete contrast to marketized systems. And if you take nothing else away from this lecture today, take away the concept of risk. Risk pooling versus risk selection. Either you have risk where we all share our risks together, or you individualize the risk, which is how a market operates. And this is the organizing principles of markets. They have to be able to select the risk, identify the risk, predict the risk, price the risk. And the risk pricing is what the market will bear. They allocate the risks through a contract, a commercial contract, and they segment the risks, cherry picking, selection, niche markets. So markets deal with risk in a very different way. And that is the only thing you need to remember from today when you're making your arguments about risk. So markets always operate through risk selection. Shareholders demand it, and operators have to be able to have a bureaucracy in places that allows them to identify risks, predict the risks, price the risks. And that is why a public bureaucracy is very different from a market bureaucracy. A public administration is designed to share the risks for equity, for resource allocation. Markets have a very different sort of bureaucracy and need a very different sort of machinery, different information and different data requirements. And you will see that in the way your new market bureaucracy is operating when you have commercial contracts, when you have pricing, when you have money following patients. These are all different ways of managing the risks through a market. I'm going to talk about the US briefly because that is the direction of travel for the UK, English NHS. And this is what we know from the evidence, and there's lots of it. It's costly and it results in denial of care, it's wasteful, inefficient, you get over-treatment, under-treatment, and fraud. And I'll take you through some very quick examples. So here's the USA at nearly 18% of GDP. 
And you can see the public share is still very large, 8% from the states and from Medicare. And the private share is also large. So here is one of the richest countries in the world with the highest costs of health care. So high that Amazon, Walmart, and some of the commercial operators are now objecting to the high costs of health care and wondering about setting up their own health care plans. Denial of care is commonplace. You all know that of the 300 million uh, plus in the US, over 60 million either have no access to health care and many millions are underinsured. And that is in spite of the Obama plan. Bankruptcies, two thirds of all bankruptcies are due to health care bills. In this country and in the UK, nobody goes bankrupt because they cannot afford to pay their health care bills. It's wasteful, inefficient over-treatment and under-treatment. And that comes from the fact that you have to operate a market. You have high transaction costs in a market. You have to sell your products. So sales and marketing has a cost. You have to bill, you have to invoice, you have to tender, you have to bid for the t contracts. You have to employ management consultants, accountants, and finance people. It's all very costly. It's also very inefficient because it results in maldistribution. And markets result in overtreatment and undertreatment. And this isn't coming from me, this is coming from the US Institute of Medicine report 2012. In 2009, the US was spending nearly $3 trillion on health care. And this is what the Institute of Medicine report said they were spending. Nearly a third of the domestic product, i.e. nearly 6% of GDP, was wasted. It was going on unnecessary services, care to people who didn't need it. And that includes giving people heart operations they don't need. Inefficiently delivered services, excess administration, prices that are too high, overbilling, overpricing, and misprevention. That total of the trillion comes to nearly a trillion. Of the three trillion, it's 790 billion. That was in 2012-9. Sorry, 2012. So, you can see the waste. And this isn't me. This is the Institute of Medicine, one of the most august bodies in the US. And they have a very detailed report breaking it down. So, here's the spending. You can see... In the UK, when we had the National Health Service, almost 80% of the budget was spent on staff. Now, in the US, it's less than two-thirds, 64%, because you have these costs. Now, these costs do not exist in a public healthcare system where you have no invoicing and billing and commercial contracts. And that's really important to remember. Markets bring new costs, lots of different kinds of costs that the public system does not have. And it brings new costs for the administration. And that's before all the profits. But the other thing that happens is that providers in marketplace engage in fraud. They have to. They need to make a profit. And the United States Department of Justice estimates that healthcare fraud by healthcare corporations comes to about 100 billion a year. And they have a special department, a healthcare fraud unit. And they have to go out and audit, monitor, they rely on whistleblowers. And then they have to follow up. And this fraud also includes unnecessary treatments, unnecessary operations, 
or billing for treatments you have not given. And the clinicians are sometimes complicit in this fraud because it's their job to find the operation the patient needs or requires rather than actually needs. And of course it's big business. All these fines are just the price of doing business and we've seen it with pharmaceutical industry. And the WHO finally woke up to the fact that markets and healthcare will never result in universal healthcare coverage. Only the rich, but even they may not receive adequate coverage. They may be the victims of overtreatment, overdiagnosis, and of course the poor and the vulnerable are excluded. And yet, in spite of this, Many countries, or most countries, are pursuing markets in healthcare for trade reasons and for trade interests. But still we have the WHO and the World Bank Group espousing the new Sustainable Development Goals. And we have to keep this and remind our politicians of this. But sometimes it feels we're moving further and further away from it. But we must keep that vision and we must keep that goal in mind. But we cannot achieve that vision without the law, because everything flows from the law and the structures to put that vision in place. So what's happening to our NHS? Well, this is the man who's in charge of our NHS, NHS England, Simon Stevens. And he was a Hartness Fellow in the United States when I was there back in the 90s, 96, 97. He then became a policy advisor to our Minister for Health, Frank Dobson, then Alan Milburn, under the Labour government, and then to Tony Blair. And then he left to become president of United Health Group and Global Health Division. So he spent nine years working in the US for this company here, which has got one of the biggest um, top-ranking global healthcare companies, which is now, incidentally, United Health at that valuation uh, in the UK. So this is the man that's in charge of our NHS under Labour, under the Conservative Coalition, and now under the Conservatives. So I'm going to take you quickly through some of the key uh, moments because. The breakup and privatization of the NHS did not happen overnight. It happens by stealth, incrementally, by small changes and big changes in the law. And you have to be alert to what's happening. And the other thing the government does is it exploits existing weaknesses in your system. So it may exploit tensions between the regions, the municipalities, the centre, the local. It may exploit weaknesses in the physicians, where if you have GPs, in our case, or blurring of the boundaries between long-term care and what is health care, social care, personal care. So the first phase was the general management reforms, when we had the early privatisation of cleaning, catering, portering. The second phase was the internal market, the purchaser-provider split. I don't know if you've all heard of this, where we established a shadow market. We did not have commercial providers, but we began by putting in the bureaucracy to enable that market. And that was really important, to change the culture and to change the thinking. So we still had public providers uh, and public authorities, but we changed the thinking to get them to think in market ways. And that was really big. That was a big bang moment, 1990. It also introduced public-private partnerships, private finance, which I'll come back to. Then in the third phase, we had the breakup of elective care, elective surgery, diagnostics, radiology, pathology, 
and that began to go out into the marketplace. The big, next Big Bang Phase 4 Health and Social Care Act, oh sorry, where we had our hospitals established as trusts, and then they were given more freedoms and powers, culminating in 2012 in the Health and Social Care Act, which removed the duty on the Secretary of State for Health to provide universal health care. That is extraordinary. A duty that had been in place since 1948 on the minister to provide universal health care throughout England was removed completely. And all area health authorities were also abolished. And instead, new organisations were created which would now be based on membership or enrollees. And we're in the last stage now where the government is trying to move towards American-style accountable care organisations, or ACOs. So what happened first was that the government unbundles all these services to put them into the marketplace. It began with long-term care, but the PFI buildings, like the ones you know, they're all out in the marketplace now. Radiology, pathology... Primary care is all being marketized now. Our nurses and doctors, ancillary. Every single piece now is now out for tender in the marketplace with big companies. Long-term care, I'll take you through quickly because it's very controversial. And we have gone further than the US in privatizing all our long-term care facilities. We have gone further in the UK than in the US. And we have a paper which compares, it looks at Sweden, I think Norway, US and UK on my website for long-term care. This was the dismantling of all the pillars I told you about, public ownership, public provision, public funding and public accountability. And the first thing the government did in 1990 was it took it from the centre as National Health Service and gave it to the municipalities, local authority. That was the first thing. And then what you see now is that the local government owned beds here are disappearing and being substituted. Sorry, uh, I don't have a pointer. But this, was lo this light green, pale green here, this lime here, are the local government owned beds. You can see them disappearing. This is, guess what? Private for profit beds. So this is a huge growth in what's happening. So local government owned beds have closed, 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 closed. Here these have opened. The NHS beds for long term care have closed, 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 closed. And um, that's the mental health, the learning disability beds, and the geriatric beds. They've all closed, closed, closed. These were the beds that were free at the point of use. Local government beds closed. And now this is entirely means tested and charged for. I should change the colors. I'm sorry about this. So what you can see is that local authorities, these are people now, not beds. So the last one was beds. These are individuals. So the number of individuals in local authority residential homes has almost disappeared. Local municipalities no longer own their own homes. They no longer run them. They contract everything out to large private for-profit companies. They began small, cottage industry, mamas and papas, and they've grown into big global corporations. So this is the ownership picture. This is what's happened. All these residents are now in private, largely for profit, care homes, paying for, out of pocket, means tested, until they're too poor to pay, spend down. That is exactly the American way. We've adopted it completely. The other thing that's happened is the number of people, our, our budgets for local authorities have been slashed. So more and more people have to pay out of pocket. And fewer and fewer people are receiving the home care services they need. So you can see that in 2000, 
one and a quarter, it reached one and a half million people by 2006-7 were receiving social care services in their home. The numbers have fallen dramatically. Now that's not because there isn't a need, it's because the government has slashed the budgets for local municipalities. So now only the most frail people get their care. There's no prevention, there's no moderate care needs. They have to pay out of pocket or go without. So we have seen a devastating decline in public provision and public funding accompanied by an enormous expansion in private long-term care provision. And that includes not just the beds, but also the Meals on Wheels and all the home care services. They're all privatized now. And the workers in that sector are paid abysmally. They're mainly women on low pay, non-unionized. They don't have holiday entitlements. They have to pay for their travel and they have to pay for their time traveling as well. It's absolutely appalling what's happening in that sector. This is the value of the market. You can see 13.15 billion. And here are some of the big companies that own Southern Cross, Booper, Four Seasons, Barchester. I think you have some of these maybe in Sweden. These are the big companies. They now own and operate all our services. So long-term care is an example of a complete, almost complete abandonment by the state, where the risks are now pushed to providers who push them to individuals, their carers and their families. This is the most vulnerable in society who have little voice or no voice at all in the marketplace. So, the second piece of the story, that is long-term care. Government's got that one out of the window. And now it's the whole story of what's happened to our public hospitals and our public facilities that were all under public ownership and control. So we have the PFI. Are you all familiar with public-private partnerships? Yes, private finance, where the government, instead of doing the borrowing, asks the private sector to raise the money, and then the government enters into long 30-year or 60-year contracts. But the money is paid back from the operating budget of the hospitals. This gives you a little bit of the story. This is what the hospitals used to... Before 1990, they paid nothing for capital. After 1990, they had to pay a charge from their operating budget, which was the blue line. So that came to about 5% of their budget. The cost of public-private partnerships are astronomical. In some hospitals, they rose to 35% of the operating budget. From 5%, 6% to 35%. You can only pay for that by cutting services closing beds and cutting staff. And that is what happened in the UK. I know you have your controversial um, PFI here, public-private partnership in the Karolinska. I don't know how much you're paying, but we have a Skanska parallel in Barts in the London where I worked, where we're paying more than 100 million a year in the charge. So this is what it means. This is the money raised. And this is the money, the billions, that will come out year on year. The yellow is what the taxpayer is playing. The green is what the private sector put in. So this is really rent-seeking behavior. The private sector is secure in 30 to 60 year contracts. And you can see we're paying more than five to six times what we would have paid if we'd raised the money ourselves. But the tragedy is that this money is being paid from the hospital budgets. It's being paid from the budgets that should pay for patient care. 
We have 159 of these PFI hospitals. Huge capital value. And here's what we're paying out. Three to four times what we should. And big annual service charges. It resulted in enormous bed closures and enormous bed lo uh, losses. And here's what's in it for the shareholders. In three hospital schemes, most of these contracts are secret. They're commercial, in confidence, very difficult to get hold of them. And no wonder the government doesn't want us to know where our money is going. So these are three hospitals, two in Scotland, one in England. The shareholders put in half a million and their dividends projected and, and probably realized now are 168 million. In Hermeyer's hospital, they put in 100 pounds and they get 89 million. Hereford, 1,055 million. These hospitals are struggling because they can't pay their charges. And so what happens is the neighboring hospitals, which are public hospitals, are being closed to pay for the PFI hospital. They're propping up, so they're like a, they're like a hoover. These PFI hospitals suck up all the income from all the hospitals and services in the area. And everything closes. One of them is apparently a Scottish hospital. Two. Common. Two are Scottish. Common or not, Scottish. Yes. In Scotland, they have a national so Scotland hasn't lost its NHS. The hospitals in Edinburgh and Scotland now do not pay from their budget. It's the boards. So the health boards or health authorities are responsible for the payments. So at least you've taken it up a level of risk. The risk isn't sitting with the provider, it's sitting with the health boards, but it's still making a big impact. But it isn't felt so much by the hospitals, so that's the big difference. And that's because Scotland reversed its internal market in 2003, so the hospitals don't feel the same pressure. But those pressures are still there. This is my hospital, Skanska, where I worked, Bart's in the London. You can see the gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, and of course, Skanska, this is the most expensive hospital, Bart's in the London. And it's crippling. And this is in the poorest area of London, where the most deprived people live. And we have closed services and sold off services to prop this hospital up. The contracts are a nightmare. You can't renegotiate them except at a price. Many of the, uh, the building, the design features are really problematic and I haven't got time to go into them. But I think it's very interesting that Skanska has a number of public-private partnerships in the UK and of course it's got its big one here. What is the name of that hospital? This is Barts and the London, St. Barth Barts and the London. And um, there is a campaign group called uh, PFI, there's a, a PFI campaign group, and they have done a nice briefing on the Barts and the London charges. Now, the government introduced PFI, but now its plan is to privatize and dispose of the assets, because... All we have left now are public land and public buildings. So the government is desperately selling off our schools, our hospitals, our roads, and that helps the balance sheet, and it gets us more and more commercialized into public sector contracts. So in 2012, it basically ended all public ownership, and it created, in the National Health Service, created two property companies it transferred all the hospitals and all the buildings that were in public ownership to these commercial property companies which now charge the hospitals a market rent. So if you haven't got a PFI, you're being charged a market rent. The argument is it makes you more efficient, but of course it's coming out of your income for patients. Um, 
And I won't go into this, but it's a huge story that hasn't been told and isn't being told. The way in which the government is either disposing and selling off property using PFI or by charging market rents. And what's happening for many of our general practices is the GP practices are closing because the market rent is more than they can afford to pay. And this explains it a little bit. Here's our Department of Health. It char the hospitals were established as trusts. They had to pay out of their income, interest and public dividend capital to the Treasury. So the Treasury is acting as banker and shareholder. You can see that. That's the internal market for the first time a charge on capital. In 1997, they introduced PFI. And this time, it's not being paid to the Treasury. It's being paid out to the private sector. Bankers, shareholders, property companies. And that's the stream of income that's coming. And now, here we have those trusts in public ownership, or oh sorry, are paying to the NHS property services, which is the government's uh, corporate uh, estate. So this is the privatization of all the NHS. You can do it in lots of different ways and the sale and disposal. So that's what's happened to land and buildings. So public ownership, essential tenet of a universal healthcare system has largely been abandoned. What about the provision? We now have outsourcing, surgery, elective care, radiology, pathology, hematology, physio, uh, physio and last of all, general practice. The government is now going really hell for leather in trying to break up and destroy general practice. General practice for us predates our National Health Service. And general practitioners are really the last bulwark. They're the last piece of opposition to the privatization of our NHS. And that's curious because they're independent. Very curious. It's a bit puzzling because general practitioners are independent practitioners but they have a contract with the government not a commercial contract but they have a, an arrangement with the government in return for which they do no private practice our GPs can do no private practice but they enter into a non-commercial contract with the government that changed in 2004 when the government decided to deregulate general practice and to, and to introduce commercial contract forms called alternative providers of medical services. And that allowed the market entry of Virgin and United Health. But still, the majority of GPs are not in commercial contracts or commercial ownership. They are independent practitioners with a non-commercial contract with the state. And they are the last piece of resistance. And this is very interesting, this story, because they were the Achilles heel in having been more privatized and they're salaried. They are now what we depend on for the resistance, in my view. But anyway, here's a list of the companies that are providing surgery diagnostics. Some of them you'll recognize. Spire, <coughs> Netcare, South Africa, Interhealth, Canadian, Fresenius, German, etc., etc. These are the companies that are here. This is primary care, companies of primary care since 2004. Public health, my specialty, has also been privatized. So all the technical bureaucracy, McKinsey's, PwC, McKesson's, Bupa, they're all in it here. And here are some of the protests, the resistance now. Now, none of this comes cheap. The Blair government understood very well that it could not push through privatization without huge injections of funds. So we were a very efficient, low-cost system, running at between 3 and 5% for more than 40 years. Look at that, how we kept the costs down and still provided a universal health system. But look how it takes off when the government introduces the internal market and then the big privatization plan. And the Blair government understood very well 
You cannot privatize without injecting huge amounts of money. Otherwise, you get opposition from the professionals and you get opposition from the public. And we have now austerity, cuts, closures, and privatization. So the public and the unions are finally waking up to what is really happening. So this was Andrew Lansley's monster, the Health and Social Care Act. Um, and these are the campaigns that went on. And this is David Owen, who was a great champion of the NHS. And this is what he said about the bill as it was going through Parliament. If this goes through, the NHS will be massively changed. It will take 5, 10, 15, or maybe 20 years to change it. But unless we pull back from this whole attitude, there will be no NHS that any of us can recognize. And tonight I feel one feeling only, overwhelming sadness. That was the night of the Health and Social Care Act. That was the end. So Parliament voted out its Health and Social Care Act and voted in the American style structures. And these are the big changes that took place. Move the duty to provide key universal services. It made commercial contracting virtually obligatory. Trust given power. All our hospitals now, nearly all the hospitals, are structurally 49% private. That means half of their facilities, services, beds can be used for private patient income. That's extraordinary. Public health, children's services transferred to the local authorities where the money is switched off. Our children in poverty are rising. The numbers of homelessness are rising. And new power is given to local authorities to make regulations for charging. And meanwhile, we've got huge deficits and private patient income is rising. And now the government is moving towards these... Oh, sorry. Uh, so I was wondering, on what grounds do you make the claim that the increased costs are due to political reform and not to advances in medical care? Ah, okay. Because we see this development everywhere, that the more we can do with medical care, the more expensive the system will be. So how can you claim that this increase in costs that you showed on the graph is actually due to political reform. Oh, I, I, what I was saying, oh, I see, you're saying these increased costs. Well, it's a political decision. It's a political decision. Why did the government manage to control the costs from here for 50 years? Technology and drugs have been in place for 40 or 50 years. It's a political decision how much you decide to pay for your health service. It's also a political decision as to how much you decide you're going to allow companies to charge for drugs, for patent protection, and for technologies. So many of these costs are the costs of the market. And we know for a fact that the UK government, because it has a large pharmaceutical industry to support, has not exercised sufficient control on prices, prices of medicines and prices of technologies. So there's very little, I mean, these are all political decisions to allow costs to go out of control and where you put your costs. Just as it was a political decision to use PFI, which is much more expensive than using public borrowing or, or, um, or, or, or raising taxes themselves. Okay, yeah. But uh, we can come back to that some, some more. Mm -hmm. So this is what the government is now bringing in. Now, what is quite extraordinary is the government now is bringing in a huge radical reform to our NHS in England with no legal or statutory basis. And this is because the government understands that, any, that, that the public do not want an American-style NHS. But if they bring primary legislation through, the public and the opposition will resist this. 
and they had a battle to get the Health and Social Care Act through. But now they're trying to do what they call workarounds. They're trying to push these plans. And the latest term, as each one of these becomes more unpopular, the government changes the name. So now they're called integrated care partnerships and integrated care systems. So the government keeps, it's a bit like the private sector, it keeps changing the name. So um, the problem is that they're predicated upon huge, these sustainability transformation plans, huge savings and new models of care, which really require closure. Um, I'm not going to go into them because I'm running out of time, I can see. I was going to explain what's happening, and I can do that. Um, but I think I should stop here um, just to say, if you want to know more about these new models of care, these accountable care organizations and what the government's doing, I can explain it a bit later in the questions, and it's also on my website. But one of the things I think is really important is there is a lot of resistance to what's happening. A huge amount of resistance. Fifteen years ago, I was a co-founder of Keep Our NHS Public, which now has 50 chapters mobilizing and organizing against hospital closures, against the deficits. Our mental health services have just about disappeared. Our children's services have been decimated. And these are really important, these local activist groups. We have Doctors for Our NHS, which are physician-led uh, campaign groups. And we also have a campaign group for the reinstatement of our NHS legislation. And that, has, that bill has been a private member's bill and has been in the House of Lords twice and the House of Commons three times. It would be fantastic if Labour were to adopt this bill, and that would be a real sign of their commitment to the NHS. Meanwhile, we have this judicial review and our court hearing on the 23rd and 24th. We still have a government with minority, a majority, but it's a weak government, as you know. Brexit has made it very vulnerable. It's un deeply unpopular. Um, and so all we are doing at the moment is holding back the privatization very slightly. All we can do with this, this ACO challenge will, has put the plan, government plans on hold. They have been forced to put their plans on hold and they have been forced to say they will go out now and do a national public consultation. The government was trying to introduce this accountable care organization, which would establish these organizations through commercial contracts, not through statute, and it was doing it through the back door. It has now said it will hold a national public consultation on the implementation, but not on the policy. So this judicial review has put these plans on hold, but it has not put on hold the major waves of privatization that are now taking place. And so please watch this space. Um, do not lose heart. I think um, the resistance is really important. And always keeping the big picture of what is happening is vitally important. There are lots of fantastic examples of people working well on the ground in spite of what's going on, but it's the big picture and the direction of travel that becomes important. So I'll end with Stephen Hawking's, you know, look at the stars, not down at your feet. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you so much.